she said that she would murder you through a spiritual. No, she said I can murder you. I can murder you. And, then, and she's and talking then, in a spirit. I will kill you. Spiritual. No, she talks in physically. I will kill you because you're not Charles, and nobody will care. Okay, so she she at this point doesn't think you are her husband. She thinks I'm Mick Schneider. Who's Mick Schneider? I have no idea. Okay. It's the name she used. I don't know where it came from. Okay. I just I'm just like I'm as bewildered as you are. This is so far into me. Normal people, as far as I'm concerned, but you know, uh, this happens. It just drives me. I don't know what to do. I need help, and she needs help. She needs help. Hello, my lovelies. Well, today's case is one that I wasn't going to do. It's one that I've thought about doing many times because you've asked for it so often. And I actually was going to let this one slide until she's in the press again. And at that point, I was like, you know what? This is current. People have got questions. I guess that some of you will know this case intimately. Some of you will be coming new to this case because it's not necessarily the one that's been in the press absolutely in the last few months. But hopefully, no matter where you are on the have I seen it, have I not seen it spectrum, you'll take something away from this that you might not already have known. Also, to to those of you who are new to my channel, I release my content twice weekly here and also I release on my Patreon and my YouTube community channels so if you want to sign up there you can do so and you will find that there is extra full length content every single week also on Patreon there are podcasts so hopefully there's a good mix of things there that you can enjoy and I appreciate every single one of you who signs up because it makes such a difference to my life and to the videos that I can of course create here. So let's dig deep into the life background and of course the crimes of Laurie Noreen Cox because that was the name that she was born with. Obviously today we're going to be looking at her as Laurie Vallow and Laurie Vallow Daybell which is who she has become known as but when she began her journey in this world Laurie Noreen Cox was actually born to a very loving family. That was on the 26th of June 1973. That was in San Bernardino in California her family was a large family. She grew up with her parents, Barry and Janice Cox. She had several siblings, in fact. So it would have been a busy household and she was a much loved member of that household. Now, one of the things that the family was known for, and in fact, Laurie Vallow Daybell is indeed known for, is that she comes from a history of very strong religious belief systems. So her family itself is very engaged with the teachings of the Church of the Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the LDS Church. So the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is a spiritual foundation, shall we say, for the family, and it certainly had an impact on Laurie from a really young age. And research does tell us that children who grow up in incredibly strict religious households, they can psychologically struggle at times. There has to be more of a moderate reality to their experience. So what I'm saying here is that it feels like even though they followed this particular belief system, it was still full of love as a household. The rules and rigor didn't become some kind of harsh disciplinarian situation. And she was allowed to enjoy the way that she looked and so on and so forth. So even though they are practicing a particular religion, I do feel that as she was growing up, there was room for manoeuvre. What we know about people who grew up in very Puritan households or households where parents think more about religious text and doctrine than they do about their children's feelings, that can cause a huge amount of conflict, particularly when you're growing up in a Western environment where you can see other people enjoying life and you don't get a choice to enjoy life. And unfortunately, children who grew up in those environments often feel that they have to live a life that's secret from their parents, which is deeply problematic because relationships should be about trust. And as a parent, you should be the one forging that trust and not making your child feel like they're stood behind glass looking at a world around them that's going past and they're not allowed to be a part of it. But like I said, when you've got a household that practices a religion and does it in a way that is compassionate and moderate to some degree, you actually often find that children feel very secure. Now, she attended local schools in California. There isn't a lot of information about her academic achievements during her childhood, but certainly those religious activities were very central to her development and to her community that she shared within that particular belief system. Laurie was described by people who knew her as being bright, being a very friendly child, she was very cute, she was very attractive, and she was known to be, as she grew older, very charismatic. And that charisma also meant that the religious ideas that she had and religious ideas that she followed, understandably, she was able to spread. We just have to think about some of our more, shall we say, charismatic cult leaders. And with respect, they don't start off being malevolent 
They often start off with some pretty good intentions, somebody like Jim Jones, the People's Temple. He started off as a preacher at 24 years of age, genuinely going for a more equal world, and rightly so, saying that whether you were black or white or Asian or Chinese, you were human and you deserve to be respected. And that's a great thing. He introduced food banks and he introduced free legal advice for people struggling. He introduced a place where you could search for jobs. These are amazing things. Just sadly, he then declined into being a malevolent murderous cult leader. Like I said, doesn't always begin that way. Now, it feels like Laurie used that charisma to her advantage, shall we say. And as she becomes more serious about religion, the interests that she has, I would say, become a little bit less mainstream and they start to affect her life choices unbelievably significantly. Now, before we move on to all that, as she moved into adulthood, she basically spent a few years at community colleges. She didn't seem to have any particular academic desire. She didn't want to go to university, etc. But she was very family centric and she did hold jobs across the years and her focus, I would say, throughout those years was still based on what she believed was most important, which is family. And I would say for the most part, through her childhood, adolescence and into her early adulthood, what she was focusing more than anything was becoming a person who had her own family. You know, it was about marriage, it was about connection, it was about children. And to all intents and purposes, she started out effectively. People who knew her said that that was certainly centric to her nature. She did work as a hairstylist early on in her adult life, and that job obviously allowed her to bring in money. And during her first marriages, that was really important because she was growing her family. But I would say even though she had this work experience and she was good at what she did, you can clearly see that whenever you see pictures of Laurie Vallow when she's younger, she looks good. It is still, like I said, not the central foundation of who she is. Her family is the central foundation of who she is. Now, Laurie's interests, I would say, then later shift towards more religious endeavors. She gets involved with groups. She gets involved with individuals who have a very similar spiritual perspective to her. And she especially has this idea evolving within her nature about the end of times. But again, her main focus is being a homemaker and those deepening religious convictions are incremental as opposed to immediate. So. Her main energy is not on career, it's on religious beliefs, but also family. Now, like I've mentioned before we move on, she was brought up in the LDS church. So just in case some of you don't actually know what the LDS church is, I'm just going to summarize their basic beliefs. And I apologize if you are a member of the LDS and I don't get everything right. Please bear with me. So the Church of the Latter-day Saints, it traces its origins to a religion founded by Joseph Smith in the United States in 1830. And a lot of you will have heard the term Mormon, which is because people who are from LDS, they do actually follow the Book of Mormon. And that was published by Smith in 1830. Now, the use of that term is actually discouraged by the church itself, but it's the one that sticks. And I suppose that some of you will know about the musical Book of Mormon. So again, it's there's an association with it that's inescapable. It's an international movement now, and it's basically characterized by a really unique understanding of the Godhead. So the emphasis essentially on family life. They also believe in revelation and desire order. They have this big respect for authority. A man is the head of the household, for example. They also very much are committed to missionary work. So you might get a knock on your door and there'll be two smartly dressed young men and they might say to you, I'd like to talk about our mission and talk about what we believe in. And they're always very, very pleasant people in my experience. I'm sure that girls do it too, but nonetheless, my experience has always been of two very smartly dressed young men, usually in a shirt and some nice trousers and a tie. And they're standing there to talk about what they believe in. Now, its members, they really do obey strict prohibitions. They're not allowed to have alcohol, tobacco, coffee, and tea, apparently. They also have a very very big emphasis on work, on working hard, you know, working hard. And that's not just in your job, but with your family. So that is essentially where her belief system stems from. And they're the foundations of that belief system. Like I said, I'm sorry if I get some of that wrong. Now, Laurie, she gets married early. This is in 1992. She's 19 years of age. Bear in mind, in the UK, that would be considered a very young age. But in America, 
Getting married quite young is still quite a typical experience, certainly in Bible Belt areas. And we have to remember that family is central to the LDS. So therefore it makes sense that most people around her are indeed getting married at 18 and 19 years of age. So it's not atypical in any way, shape or form. And she actually married her high school sweetheart, Nelson Yanes. It didn't work out. The pair actually got divorced not long after marrying and they didn't share any children between them. But that does not deter Laurie. And this is why I'm noting that no matter how rigorous and religious her household was, they obviously were very accepting because she's got divorced and they'd likely be like, you know, that's not the best thing to do where the LDS church is concerned. But not only does she get divorced, in 1995, she marries William Lajoa. Now she has a son with William. He's called Colby Ryan. And what can I say? It didn't go well. So that's also very short lived. They get divorced in a year. So to be involved in two marriages, yes, she's relatively young still. So I appreciate that we make really bad decisions often when we are young. We all appreciate when we're 19, we're not who we're gonna be at 39. But still to rush in and to get divorced and then to rush in and get divorced again to some degree, that demonstrates an impulsivity. And I think that we have to remember when we look at somebody's psychological past and also their actions within that past, we have to look at notable events. And two marriages in a very short period of time that last for a very short period of time, it suggests there is something fractured in what's going on, whether in that individual or in the relationships they engage in. Still, let's just say Laurie doesn't get the memo on maybe thinking about whether marriage is for her. In fact, she doesn't get that memo pretty much full stop. And she has a third marriage. This is to a guy called Joseph Ryan in 2001. Now at this point he legally adopts Laurie's son Colby. They do actually have a daughter together and the daughter is Tylee Ryan, that's in 2002. And I would say that what I understand of that relationship is it was very toxic and I would say there was a level of abuse within it. Now Laurie and Joseph end up getting divorced in 2004. So again, we are talking about incredibly short periods of time where Laurie is concerned in relationships. And of course, we never victim blame. We appreciate that if you're an individual who is in a toxic situation where there is abuse involved, you need to get out. But it's just more about what kind of presence of mind does this woman have to just go on this merry-go-round, essentially, of meeting, marrying, divorcing. It's not typical for somebody so young. Now, following that divorce, there was a custody battle and basically that would have been very acrimonious. That would have been a big struggle because she wanted the kids and he wanted the kids. And during that time, Laurie's brother, Alex, who I would say is a key component of this entire story, who is unbelievably protective towards Laurie. I would actually say there is a weirdness about their connection, not an incestuous relationship. I'm not pushing that idea. I'm not pushing the idea that they did a monster about the Menendez brothers, which was absolute BS. I'm just saying that sometimes you can have these relationships in life which are fused they're incredibly close and they're fused. And whilst on one level, that means you've always got somebody who has your back, you've got people that are on your side, it can also mean that that relationship is at an immature level. There's a childishness around it. It doesn't have the emotional integrity that it should have. It's more of a codependent relationship. And I genuinely believe that Alex fits that dynamic entirely. I think he worships Laurie. I think she has the communication skills, the style, all of the things that he's lacking and he just holds her in great esteem to his own detriment with respect. Now, during this challenging battle that's going on regarding custody, Alex steps in and ends up assaulting Joseph. And this is because he says Joseph's been abusive to his sister. Now, again, we understand that and there'll be a lot of people who'll be nodding their heads and saying, look, go Alex, at the end of the day, if you're hitting a woman, if you're being abusive to a woman, then you better hope she hasn't got a big brother because you know it might end badly for you. You know, I'm old school, I get it. There are more ways to manage things than to just have the local authority, police force coming. But at the same time, it can mean that he's been placed in a position of power 
in certain scenarios that really he shouldn't have. You know, it suggests that Alex feels that he has to act in a certain way where his sister's feelings are concerned. And the problem with that is you usually only get a one-sided story. Like we're all the victims in our own story on the whole. You have to be quite self-actualized to look at something that's played out and be like, what role do I have in that? A lot of people, in fact, for the most part of my experience working therapeutically, one of the things that I have to do with my clients is help them to understand that we are a part of every scenario. Like when people say to me, oh, my friend lies to me all the time. I'm like, do you challenge that? And if they say no, my response is it takes two people to create a lie. Because if your friend lies to you and you're like, you're lying to me, it ends it there. If we comply with that scenario, if we collude with it, then the lie spreads. And it's exactly the same here. You can be told by somebody, this person has been incredibly abusive to me, but it's their visual on it. Now, clearly, if you see people who've been bruised or you know that somebody's being financially exploited, you can completely connect with that. But what I'm saying is, unless you have been privy to certain behaviors, it's much harder to have a view of it as it's played out. When it comes down to Alex, Alex takes everything she says at face value. And believe me, that is this guy's downfall from the get-go. So he is violent towards this man, which could have caused him serious issues, of course, because you can't go around assaulting people. And there's also an audio recording that surfaces from this time. And this is when Laurie is talking to somebody about wanting the pain to stop, wanting her ex to come after her and her children. And she actually says on this recording that she's considered murdering Joseph. Now I get it. A lot of us will be like, oh my God, I've considered murdering a few people. We all know that. Look, I always laugh about this, but I actually mean it wholeheartedly. A lot of us have a kill list in our head, but what makes us a good person is that we don't action that kill list. You know, People have one person several times on their kill list. We're not doing it. We're playing with the ideas because somebody did something to us. And whilst we're not going to seek vengeance, we just hold it in our heads sometimes that we would maybe like to make it so that person disappeared from the earth. We don't act on it. That's how we know we're a good human being. But we don't often voice that to other people, even when it's jokey. And we certainly don't voice it in a way that makes it sound like we we're actually talking about something that we strongly considered. But she was recorded saying, I went through a lot of years of this kind of hard stuff and I was gonna murder him. I was going to kill him, like the scripture says, like Nephi killed, just to stop the pain and to stop him coming after me and to stop him coming after my children. So there's a big irony there, isn't there? because it's very egocentric. I appreciate she's bringing her children into it. She's saying, you know, I don't want him to come after my children and I don't want him to come after me. But really what she's saying when you unpuck it is, I am happy to kill somebody if they get in my way. Now she didn't go ahead at this moment in time and kill him, but nonetheless, that's what you're hearing. You know, I've got this pain. I don't want him to get my kids. So I'm thinking probably the best way forward is to murder him. And to use the word murder as well, that really interests me because if I were saying something about wanting to kill somebody, I would use the term kill. And the reason for that is there would actually be a reality behind my actions based in how I was being treated in such a context that the only way I thought I could escape was to actually kill the person. Murder? That's very different. Murder is something that is often premeditated. It's a level that isn't about a crime of passion. It isn't about self-protection. It's about thinking about why you're gonna go ahead and do it and then carrying it out. And she's obviously contemplating this back after she's left him. Now, interestingly as well, this is quite a big year because apart from her marriage, shall we say declining into a realm where she's considering murder being some kind of option, she hasn't let go, shall we say, of her confident exterior. So in 2004, she actually competes in the Mrs. Texas pageant and she's representing her local community at this point. And basically she looks great, not gonna deny it. And it also shows how it invested she was in beauty and in her personal presentation that had been a part of her life for quite a long time. Like I said, she was qualified in hair and she likes being considered attractive. That goes without saying. And I just want to throw in vanity isn't actually an acceptable thing as a religious person. Just going to throw it in there, Laurie. Vanity is not considered an acceptable way of being. You know, at the end of the day, you shouldn't be wanting to do that if you're a truly religious human being according to your own scripture. But I digress. 
And the same year, she actually ends up on the episode of the television game show Wheel of Fortune. And in that show, you know, she comes across as fun and flirty and smiley and peaches and cream is what I would say. And you know, that's going out to a national audience. So that does speak a little bit of her ego. I genuinely believe that. Because what we're gonna talk about throughout this is a level of delusion, but also how egocentricity can play into those delusions. And we can look at things on a mental health level, and we can also look at things on an arrogance level. It is possible to hold both of those in the same space and come to the conclusion about a human being who, shall we say, could have some issues on a mental health level, but who is undeniably fractured in some very malevolent ways. Now, those brief stints in the public eye they, I guess, give us some insight into her liking the spotlight. And I suppose we can say that that wanting to be center stage, adding to that religious conviction, adding to that the ability to be charismatic, you know, that lays the ground to bring others into the fold if she decides, you know what, I might want to become a leader. Because literally her personality traits absolutely can be applied to people who end up leading cults. Now, Laurie's fourth husband, because she isn't finished yet, she isn't finished yet, he's a guy called Charles Vallow. The pair get married in 2006, they get married in Las Vegas, and I think Las Vegas must be an awesome place to get married. It also throws me into that questioning again of, ah, was this impulsive? Was this a scenario where they get married and it's a whim? Because... Las Vegas is often associated with things like that, although I've got friends who've got married there and they've been married for decades. I'm just throwing it out there that it kind of fits in with her mindset and profile. Now, Charles Vallow, nice guy. Just gonna get that out from the get-go because there's been a lot of reports about Charles Vallow and she's had her say about Charles Vallow and it's just BS. This guy's born on August the 17th, 1956. He was raised in Lake Charles, Louisiana. He's somebody who apparently was a really ethically strong individual, and that's both personally and also to do with work. You know, he was good at what he did. He was very warm as a human being. Apparently he went on to work in quite a lot of different business management and financial roles, and eventually he was very successful as an executive in the financial services industry. So he's a smart cookie. People who knew him said he was just somebody who had this generosity of spirit. And I will tell you now, having watched body cam footage of this man before his very sad demise, there is absolutely something about him that makes you go, this guy's understanding. There is something about his nature where you can hear that even in the worst of times, he's finding things difficult to comprehend and he's having horrible things done to him by Laurie. But for whatever reason, he can't compute that it's possible that the woman that he fell in love with could ever be the human being that she's turning into without some really serious issue having occurred, such as a mental breakdown. There is something about Charles Vallow that even in moments where you just want him to protect himself, you can see he's trying to fundamentally figure out why is this happening? This makes no sense. And he had apparently a huge love for his family. He had a real dedication to the people that he cared about. As I said, they got married in 2006, but they'd actually met in the early 2000s and they connected through friends. They apparently got close very quickly. That does not surprise us when looking at her past relationship history. He had been married before, so they both brought children into their new relationship. He had a, two children from a previous marriage and he actually shared custody of those children, both boys, with his ex-wife. So this should be a point of celebration. They found each other, they're moving forward with their lives. They've got a blended family because obviously Laurie has children as well and Charles literally embraced Laurie's children as his own. You couldn't have wanted more for a stepfather. And together, they weren't even father. So they adopted Laurie's grandnephew, JJ. And apparently Charles was just devoted to JJ, cared for him as his son. And JJ did have some issues as well. He was diagnosed as being autistic, but this did not sway in any way, shape or form the way that his adoptive parent felt for him. He was loved and cherished beyond measure. Also, one of the things about Charles Vallow was he was actually Catholic, but instead of carrying on down that road and being like, this is my religion, you have yours, Laurie, you have your LDS religion, I'm gonna stick with the old Catholic church, that's the one I'm going with, 
he actually went so far as to convert to the Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints after meeting Laurie. So he's obviously compelled by her in so many different ways to the point where he decides he is going to convert. And he was apparently a very spiritual person. He wasn't extreme in his beliefs like Laurie was, but people said if you had to describe him, he was an anchor to the people around him. So the couple are now raising Tylee Ryan, her daughter, and JJ, their adopted child, together. And it's going well. It's also worth noting that at this point, people who knew Laurie said that she was literally an ideal mother. She had great patience. She was deeply compassionate. Her and her daughter got on incredibly well. And everybody who knew her described her as a loving mother. In fact, when it starts to play out that some really evil things have happened in this case regarding Laurie's children disappearing, her mother, and sister go on national TV and do a full documentary saying how everybody's wrong about Laurie. That literally she's the nicest, kindest human being in the world, hasn't got a bad bone in her body and 100% believe everything is gonna be okay. It doesn't matter how weird things are. It doesn't matter how twisted things turn out. What matters as far as they are concerned in that moment is to stand by somebody they know and love because they genuinely think they know and love her. Honestly, I have no doubt whatsoever in the moments that they are sat dealing with documentary makers, asking them questions, and they're asking some very prying questions, they are sitting there 100% fully believing what they are saying. They absolutely think that Laurie is the most peaches and cream, adorable human being who would never so much as harm a hair on the head of their children. It's as simple as that. It doesn't, shall we say, end well for them. And on reflection, I imagine they think to themselves, maybe a bit of hindsight makes me consider not acting on impulse and going ahead and saying yes to documentaries before I've got all of the details. But you know, like I said, they've got years to reflect on that decision. Now, Tylee, she's a child who's apparently absolutely wonderful. She's an amazing big sister to JJ. She actually used to refer to JJ as her own child because he and she were incredibly close and things are going okay. They really are. I would say for a start, we have a period of time where a marriage works out. Charles Vallow is providing for Laurie and for their children, and it is going well. They have a nice life. She's afforded a good living situation. So you think that it's over a decade before we can see things starting to turn for the worse, shall we say. And apparently people who knew Laurie 2017, 2018, and knew her before that, said that she started to change. So like I said, before 2017, 2018, we've got Laurie being held up as his doting mother. She's devoted to the church. She's always looking stunning, essentially. But suddenly things change. Her demeanor changes, her behavior changes. And one of the things that they noted was she'd started reading the books by doomsday authors. Honestly, guys, you know, I have a faith, a big faith in big G-O-D. It keeps me going through the good times, through the bad times. I never ever feel that I'm alone because I have that connection and I own that connection. Everyone's different. I'm sure that loads of people are atheists. I'm sure that loads of you are Muslims. I'm sure that loads of you have Hindu belief systems. We've all got our beliefs and some of us choose not to have beliefs. That's cool. Do what you will. It's what makes us so wonderfully diverse. But for the most part, I take great comfort from my faith. I'm not actually walking around going, do you know what I need in my life? No, what do you need in your life? I need a bit of anxiety. What kind of anxiety? I'm talking apocalyptic style anxiety. That sounds, that sounds awful. It's, it's, it's the end of days. It's the David Koresh Branch Davidians kind of thing. It's the worst of the worst. It's fiery. Why? Why, why do you want to do that? I don't know. I just feel like I need a bit of darkness burning, death, destruction, and hopefully some nice stuff at the end if we kind of get through it without being incinerated. Honestly, I don't know why anybody wants to read doomsday books. Just saying, guys, if you've thought about it, I'm gonna go out, get myself a doomsday book, don't. Just let's not do that. Let's not do that. Let this video heed a warning to you about why we should never go down these kind of roads and influences because indeed we could end up meeting somebody like Chad Daybell for a start. Anyway, I digress. So she's into this doomsday stuff and in particular she'd read the books of who I've just mentioned, 
Chad Dable, apparently an author, but he's one of those authors that is quite a prolific writer and he's a self-published author, shall we say, but he's popular in these areas. And he'd written several fiction books all about preparing for the end of the world. Because obviously, he's a happy chappy as well. Now, during her reading these particular books, there is a level of being consumed by them, shall we say. Now, for those of you who genuinely don't know what a doomsday author is, it's somebody who basically writes about the apocalyptic or the end of the world type themes. So they will tend to write things about religious or spiritual beliefs, but also will have predictions of, what can I say, cataclysmic events? Also, some of them will create fictional narratives, so not everybody will be real, and the actual writings won't necessarily be absolute prediction. But some of them do actually present their writing as non-fiction. So basically they say, oh, this just sounds a little bit out there. Sounds a little bit like I'm writing something that isn't true, but really, it's just a prediction. I'm predicting that this will actually happen, that there is an impending apocalypse, and I know all about it. So their words in these books, they tend to focus on things like themes of judgment, of survival, of preparation for coming end times or of a divine reckoning. And Chad Dable's one of those doomsday authors. He apparently had these apocalyptic novels that centered around these end of times. They were loosely based apparently on his interpretations of Latter-day Saint theology. So let's just be clear about that. Not actually the LDS theology, but Chad's LDS theology. Sorry Chad, are you, are you actually the person who created LDS? Well, I mean, you might not think so, but I may have an insight that maybe I might be, or somebody I know might be, but but you're not you're not actually, are you? No, no, I'm not. I'm not. Why are you writing these books, kind of interpreting LDS in a way that isn't accurate? Well, because I think I'm a messiah. Because let's be honest, we all know, don't we, that Chad Daybell is the type of human being who's got an ego so massive and a recognition that he is not really that special, that it's such a mismatch that he can't help just desperately trying to convince others that maybe he's special. That's what happens with these kind of egomaniacs. They just want to be seen as special. So he's doing this interpretation of the latter day saying, so if you spoke to somebody who was actually a preacher, they'd just go, yeah, no, no, none of that's true, but Chad didn't get that message. So in these books, he's basically writing about how a chosen few survive this series of catastrophic events that lead to, what can I say, a divine, purified existence for the righteous. So I've burnt in flames. You've all burnt in flames. There's going to be somebody there going, no, Emma, I haven't. I absolutely haven't. I've just bathed in holy water. I've just gone around my house gods and they've all said I'm one of the chosen few and my cat is wearing a crown. So you clearly didn't get the memo there. I am saying that for the most part we all know that according to the people like Chad we are definitely going to be, you know, pushed off the plank into the fiery waters before any of them are. But this is what he believes that this is divine, purified existence for the righteous, of which, of course, he is. And he self-publishes these numerous books because no one will give him a publication deal because everyone's like, that's a bit depressing, Chad. I'm not okay with some of this content here, particularly where I think that you're suggesting that I won't make it to the righteous state. But anyway, this is what his narrative is. It combines visions, it's got natural disasters in it, it's got moral purges, and it's also got spiritual warfare. If that isn't the kind of positive reading that you need on a Thursday and a Friday, I don't know what you're spending your time reading. Forget things that you actually enjoy. Forget serial killer books, which let me tell you, are at least a little bit more hopeful when it comes down to it, because you survive at the end, as opposed to reading Chad Daybell's, well, let's be clear, we all die horribly, aside from him, who probably goes on to, I don't know, be drenched in white pure light and ascends to heaven just as he is, because he's so absolutely incredibly wonderful. Now, beyond fiction, Chad Daybell, he espoused specific doomsday beliefs, shall we say. He said he had these visions, spiritual insights about the coming apocalypse. So this isn't just his writing, he's having these conversations with people. And he also had this, oh, uncanny ability, guys, uncanny ability. Chad Dable isn't just a writer, he's not just a prolific writer. He's not just spending his time with a paper and pen, probably a laptop these days, but you know where I'm going. No, no, no. Chad isn't just about the writing. He's not about the getting stories across to an interested audience. No, 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 no. 
He's more than that. He is a prophet and he can see visions, give spiritual insights, and also he can identify dark and light spirits in people. And actually, if you were unlucky enough to be a dark spirit, he would label you as a zombie. And as a zombie, it meant that you were possessed and you were basically unable to be saved, which is, again, another reason why he's such a positive guy. Now, according to his teachings, removing these dark or possessed individuals was actually spiritual duty. It was part of a cleansing process he felt was necessary to prepare the chosen few for the apocalypse. So I'm not sure when I want to go on that spectrum. I don't think there's a positive any way you look at it where Chad Dable is concerned. If you're dark, you're a zombie and, you know, you need to be outed in some way and disposed of. And if you are a light and you're one of the chosen few, you just have to worry about the apocalypse coming. Can somebody please draw any positive from that kind of mindset? But this is where we are. And also, isn't that intriguing that this guy is so aloof, so superior, so narcissistic that his belief is that he has been bestowed with this talent for seeing beyond human and being able to see who the zombies are. And all I imagine when I say that is I one day hope that Chad Daybell will be put somewhere let loose where the World War Z zombies can give him a chase. Because I genuinely think that if anybody deserves that kind of demise, Daybell is certainly the one who I would be rooting for to achieve it. Now, Chad had a wife named Tammy Daybell. He had five children with Tammy. To all intents and purposes, what I know about Tammy Daybell is what a lovely human being. Now, they all lived outside Rexburg, Idaho, and essentially people thought they were a happy couple. Let's just put it out there straight away. It felt like he was a relatively devoted husband, certainly a much loved father, and there was nothing outside of the ordinary when people were looking into their relationship that stood out as, oh dear, we might be dealing with something really toxic or problematic. Now, he moves to Rexburg from Utah in 2015, and the reason that he did that was he claimed that he'd heard voices telling him to relocate there. Again, let me make it clear, I am not suggesting that certain people in this world do not hear voices that are prophetic. I'm not suggesting that there are not people who cannot speak to the dead. I don't know. I live my life in a state of not knowing. I hate it when people are just disparaging of other people's belief systems. I just think it's wrong. But I would say for the most part, very few people would have that gift if that gift exists. And I do not believe that Chad Daybell has that gift whatsoever. Do I feel that there is a level of delusion to this man's psychology? 100%, and we'll go into that later. But the very fact that he says, I've heard voices telling me to relocate there, well, you know what, if you come in from a religious background, you've got the good grace of a wife who trusts you, children who love you, you could just say that, couldn't you? Oh, I've just had this vision. Okay, what vision? We've got to move. I really like it. I know, but I've had a vision. So it's not me saying we've got to relocate and leave all your friends. It's not me. i got to help it. I'm a chosen one. It's the big G-O-D. Are you turning the big G-O-D down? No, no, I just, I just said I didn't really want to leave my friends. Exactly. So... Pack now, and remember, I'm not to blame because I'm out of vision and we've got, to, we've got to relocate. I wish it worked in that respect because I'd be like, Pete, I've had a vision. Yeah, what's the vision? We need to relocate to Hawaii. And also, you need to win the Euro Millions. Okay, just make it happen last Wednesday. You know, it just is one of those things, isn't it? It doesn't set well with me because I think if you're quite a powerful controlling person who dominates, then arguably this is a good excuse to utilize power over somebody by suggesting that by denying the vision, you're denying God. And if you've got a very religious partner, as he did have, that could work effectively. Now, the fateful event that we're going to talk about that leads to all the events that follow. Laurie, with all of her interest in Doomsday, meets Chad at a 2018 event. This is where Chad is sitting there publicising one of his books. And apparently when Laurie meets Chad, there is something electric about their connection. Now, bear in mind, both of them are married to other people. And Laurie's friends said they immediately knew there was something quite unusual about them. 
and they started to build their relationship very quickly. They started doing religious podcasts together, for example. So now they're kind of spending time, they're sharing space. And we all know that common interests can certainly be something that leads to compatibility. And I would undeniably believe that they are interested on a sexual level in each other from the get-go. And let me tell you, Chad Daber probably thinks that all these Christmases and birthdays have come at once because she is an attractive woman and he is Chad Daber. Now the pair, I would say, have this foliage. It's as simple as that. They've got this delusion that becomes stronger because they both believe their own BS. And that's deeply worrying, it's deeply concerning. Now their beliefs are that they are special. Of course they are, we know how this works guys. They are special, they're not like you and me. No, 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 they're not like you and me. They are better than us. And Chad, oh, Chad has got this bit of information, you know? He's sitting there, he's like, oh, wait, wait a minute, I'm having a bit of a vision here. And Laurie's like, yeah, give me a vision. He's like, you are a sexual goddess. And Laurie's not gonna be like, oh, okay. <laughs> like, I'm not really, you know? Any woman who is, shall we say, getting a little bit older, and is feeling maybe like the world isn't seeing her as visually as it may once have. And you got this guy going, oh my gosh, it turns out that you are a sexual goddess. And I know because the big G.O.D. said so. You ignore all those young Instagrammers who look like their body is so firm that you can bounce the 50 pence piece off them. Forget them, you're the sexual goddess. And obviously bringing sex into it in this way is because he's interested in her sexual, so how convenient. And he also says, and guess what? It's not only that you're a sexual goddess, Laurie, we were married. We were actually married in our past life. Now think about the mental gymnastics here and wow, the efficiency of what he's saying because it's very, very effective psychologically. You have Laurie, who is somebody who likes the way that she looks, is somebody who wants to be seen as attractive, who has not necessarily found her feet in the world but wants to be super special. You have her in a relationship that's lasted for a period of time, much longer than her prior ones. She's probably a little bit bored. The slings and arrows of outrageous fortune have occurred. She's bringing up a child with special needs. She's got a daughter growing through the motions of adolescence. And you know, things can be a little bit more challenging than they were when you're young and free. And then suddenly, in all of that boredom, this guy just walks in, apparently sweeps you off your feet by suggesting you have been married to him before. And then you're like, well, is it adultery if we start seeing each other? It's, no, no, it's not adultery because we were married before. So basically, I've been committing adultery on you by being married to Charles. You can see how that would work psychologically. So he is really manipulative. That is clear from the very start. And the pair start to talk about zombies, these people whose souls have been replaced by dark spirits. He claims that Laurie, is actually somebody who's gonna help him save the world. She's gonna be part of gathering 144,000 people to prepare literally for the second coming of Christ. Now, for those of you who don't know what the concept of the 144,000 people is, well, in Mormonism, it's basically rooted in an interpretation of the Bible, specifically the book of Revelation. So in Revelation 7 and 14, the 144,000 are described as a group of people sealed by God. So that means it represents a really select group who've been chosen to carry out special roles, shall we say, in preparation for and during the second coming of Jesus Christ. And the number itself is actually symbolic. It's often interpreted to represent a gathering of the most faithful saints who are prepared to assist in establishing God's kingdom on earth. So in the context of the latter day saint theology, the 144,000 are actually seen typically as high priests. They're gonna help in this final gathering. They're gonna teach the righteous in those final days. They're gonna prepare the world for Christ's return. And even though I would say this tends to be accepted as metaphorical or symbolic, some individuals have taken it on a literal level or have applied their own interpretations like Chad Daybell, for example, especially when it comes down to focusing on those apocalyptic beliefs. So Chad Daybell and Laurie Vallow, they're influenced by this idea, but then they take it to this extreme level. So he's teaching that she and he are among this 144,000, that they've got this divine mission. So essentially they've been chosen and now it's their job to select who else is worthy. And that's a radical interpretation. It's deviated massively from mainstream LDS, 
but this is what essentially will be the downfall of themselves and most importantly, their victims. And a former friend of Laurie said, at this time, Laurie starts referring to her husband, Charles, as a demon. So, how convenient that at a point where, shall we say she's met a guy who's telling her she's a sexual goddess and maybe the second coming of some sort, she suddenly starts to see her humdrum husband, Charles, as demon. Forget that he's provided for them. Forget that he's brought her kids up with her. Forget that he's a really nice guy. Let's just demonize him. And that's essentially a way of dehumanizing somebody. Now we all know when we look at people who have the capacity to dehumanize people, it does not end well often for those people they are dehumanizing. Let's think about Jeffrey Dahmer, for example, very effective dehumanizer of his victims because it made it easier to kill them. So by titling somebody as a demon, you sidestep their humanity. If you sidestep their humanity, you do not have to be humane to them. Charles is understandably blindsided about what's happening. He's really worried about Laurie because she's got these strange beliefs that are escalating. He's telling people that she's claiming to be the reincarnated wife of Mormonism founder, Joseph Smith. So just let that sink in. You know, Joseph Smith started the LDS. Yeah, she's now claiming that she used to be his wife. And also who is saying that she used to be married to him? Oh, Chad Daybell. And who's interpreting things in a really weird way regarding LDS? Chad Daybell. So there's some very odd connections going on here. And Charles was telling people that Laurie no longer cared for him, wasn't caring for their son JJ. And in 2019, Charles actually goes to the police to talk about his concerns. He tells the police that Laurie says that she's a god, that she's preparing for the end of days. And he also says, listen, Laurie has actually threatened to kill me. So this is a real change in character as far as he is concerned. And we get to February 2019 and Charles actually goes ahead and files for divorce. And in these papers, he expresses that he has a fear for his own life and also for his children's safety. Part of the reason for his divorce was because of these extreme religious beliefs and also the threats of violence, because it makes sense. There are irreconcilable differences and also it's highly inappropriate behavior to go around threatening you or the children you've brought up. Now, in that court filing, Charles is saying that she'd recently become infatuated and at times obsessive about near-death experiences and spiritual visions. He said that Laurie had told him that she was eternally married to the ancient Book of Mormon prophet Murano and that she had lived numerous lives on numerous planets prior to this current life. So he's going to be looking at her and thinking, I don't know what crack you're smoking, but it is stuff you need to stand to the side of because this is not good for you. And this, I suppose, is where we can argue that there could be a mental health level because when somebody is so absolutely convinced of something entirely delusional, we have to consider that there might be a fracture within their mental health. They may be dealing with a mental illness such as schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, bipolar. There could be a whole heap of reasons why psychosis could be playing a part in their life. But she's functioning in lots of other ways. And again, that's why I bring it back to this idea of egocentricity and pumping that egocentricity. This personality disorder that makes us so narcissistic, so driven to be visible to everybody else, to be special, to be seen as special, that she cannot help but hook on to what we would consider our ludicrous ideas. And when you have a permission base, because somebody around you who people respect, in this case, Chad Daybell, you have them pumping your ego in this way and convincing you that all of those crazy thoughts that you have, and let's be honest, we've all done it. You know, we've all done it. It's like when you watch people who go to past life regression and they're all Cleopatra. And for that person, it's like, oh my God, I knew. I knew I had these feelings of being all powerful. And now I realize it's because I was Cleopatra. You know, how many Cleopatras were that one? So ultimately, all of those people in past life regression could not be Cleopatra. You know, if I did a past life regression successfully, I've done a family tree way back to the 1500s. So let me tell you, I would be very, very poor, possibly working on a farm if I was lucky, or dead because I'd have died in childbirth. So that would be my past life progression. 
I wouldn't really want to do it. It wouldn't add value to my life, right? So what I'm trying to get across there is when you have somebody who's given you a permission base to pump that delusion because they are saying, yes, you are right. All those thoughts that you had about being super special. Yeah, you might not feel it in this life. Yeah, your life might not have mounted to anything enormous in this life, but it's because you are this special person. All those other lives that's when you were so enormously successful. You were such a leader. You were so paramount and important. And those feelings within you, we need to cater to them. We need to amplify them so you can step into your true self in this universe, in this paradigm. So that's the way these things are going on a psychological level. Now, Charles is rightly concerned and goes and gets a protection order from Laurie because he has this fear for his life. At this point, Laurie and Charles are living separately. She lived with her children and her brother, Alex Cox, in Chandler, Arizona. And essentially, he's not staying there, shall we say. Now, during this period of time as well, Laurie actually had to go to a hospital to be assessed. She was only there like less than 24 hours and she was released with everyone going, oh, she's absolutely fine. So again, she's very able to contain these alleged delusions and maintain some kind of form of sanity in front of doctors and psychiatrists. And again, that speaks to a very manipulative tendency within her nature. Now, Charles should be living his life freely, happily, probably with somebody else that he'd married in a relationship that he deserved because he's a good man, but that's not gonna happen. And the reason for that is in July 2019, Charles Vallow was killed. Step in, Laurie's brother, Alex. So essentially, Alex, who we already know, has previously assaulted one of Laurie's exes, shoots Charles, in what Alex claims is self-defense. Charles had basically gone to retrieve JJ from Laurie's home. This was because he wanted to drop him off at school. So that's what should have happened. But of course not, because when he gets in there, Alex Cox is waiting for him and he gets shot. It's a really challenging thing to watch play out on body cam, both where Alex Cox is concerned and where Laurie Daybell is concerned, because I cannot get my head around how calm and okay they were when a man is lying dead in their home. It makes absolutely no sense to me whatsoever. And if I was a police officer dealing with that situation, I would be deeply concerned. It just did not ring true. In the interview that you'll see with Laurie, actually talking about what had happened, she just has no connection empathically with what has occurred. Her husband, albeit ex to be, is dead. And there is just no remorse for him, no sadness for him. She's giggly. Who else is in the house? Okay, just have a seat right there. Let's get FD in here. Have a seat. Street secure. We got the gentleman out. Do you have some ID on you, sir? Yeah. What happened today? How did it get to this? I don't know. He was enraged. What's going on? What happened? Oh, he's talking with my sister earlier. No, what happened today, though? Like, just in the last 20 he's, minutes? He came to, he came at me with a bat. Okay. Was he, he living here him. or no. visiting? He came to pick up his son. Okay, is his son inside? No. My sister took him to school. Okay, so it was just you at the house? Yes. And he came, how long, what time did he come to pick up, pick up the son? Uh, I don't know, 20 minutes ago, maybe. Okay, so you know who he is, let him in? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. No, I think they were talking earlier, then she left, and then he got into it with me. Like what? What do you mean? I, I don't know. He was, he was accusing me of telling my sister because I'd broken up a tussle with them earlier. And he told me not to interfere anymore with them or I'd pay. And he came at me with a bat. Okay, so he showed up in the house with a bat in his hand? No. Okay, so? There was a scuffle earlier with my sister and my niece. My niece got involved. About earlier meaning earlier this week, earlier no, 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 this morning? this morning, before they left. Before your, your wife left? My sister. Before your sister left? Yeah. Okay, who lives here with you? Nobody, I don't live here. My sister lives here and my niece lives here. And you're yeah. just visiting? I was visiting for the night. Okay, so you're over here visiting your sister and yes. your niece? Yes. Okay, and there was a tussle between your sister and her husband? Yes. And does the husband live here or no? No. Okay. I just went back to the living room and what is your problem? With the gun in you. Yes. And I said, I want you to put that bat down and he wouldn't do it. And he's like, you, and he came at me with the bat again after he'd already hit me in the head. So I shot him to stop him. And also I would say her looks definitely play into her hands. I don't think people can take her seriously as potentially a cold blooded killer. It's probably the easiest way to start mm -hmm. um, is just to tell me what happened. 
and then so you can start what makes the most sense to you and we'll just work our way through and I'll probably I'm gonna ask you a bunch of questions just to kind of clarify. Sure. So I know you talked to the initial patrol officer. Um and he just got information. He oh, okay. Um so yeah if you can just kinda tell me kind of what happened. It sounds like some of this may have started last night or something along those lines. Right. So start where you think it makes the most sense. Okay. So um <laughs> And then um, he just started, he was screaming and he was super upset and whatever. And um, he was yelling at Tylee, don't you just me with that bad and blah, blah, blah. And so Tylee, I guess, I don't know if she swung at him or what, but he like grabbed a bat from Tylee and then went to like hit Tylee with the bat. It was, and I was right there, they were right there. And my brother grabbed him from behind, mm -hmm. like just to stop him from hitting Tylee. You go like this, like he grabbed him, like. Yeah, from behind, like uh -huh. just kind of to pull him back. Uh -huh. And then um, they got into the thing, and he's hitting him with the bat, and they're on the ground, like grappling around or whatever. And then, um, uh, I mean, I was all. And he quickly. <laughs> and he hit your brother with the bat while they were grappling and stuff. Yeah, I, yes, he was hitting him with the bat, like swinging the bat, you know, back and forth, and they were kind of like on the ground, and I was like freaking out trying to go around, knowing JJ was in the car, yeah. right, and so then he got up, and he had the bat like this towards me, and I was going around the other side to try to just get out of his range where he couldn't hit me, and then, um, I had told Tylee that she was like on the ground because after he took the bat from her, she fell back. And so I told her, I was like, go get in the car with JJ. Like, I don't want JJ coming in to the house. Or, mm -hmm. And I wanted her out of the way. I wanted the kids out of the way, whatever this fight was going to be. And then... Um, Do you remember what you, your husband or your brother were saying or yelling during all of this? If they were at all? Just kind of get off me, I don't know, or whatever, you know, whatever, they were like, like, don't talk to my niece, yeah. whatever, like, it was, I don't remember specifics, but they were kind of both, they were kind of in the heat of it, I don't think there was much, many words, words. I remember. yeah, he had, he was a base, professional baseball player, okay, <laughs> so, it wasn't a good idea for Tyler to get out of that, <laughs> probably not the, I mean, he played semi-pro, yeah, when he was, yeah, <laughs> Now, Alex tells the police that the reason that he'd shot Charles was he was trying to protect himself, he was trying to protect Laurie and also protect her daughter, Tylee. He said that Laurie and Charles had got into a fight and he'd then shot Charles in self-defense. Bear in mind as well, I think that Charles would have a right to feeling a bit pissed with Laurie. She's done some really awful things. She's removed his property, she's taken his car away. There are a whole heap of reasons why he's not gonna be happy but then he's turned up to take his son to school and essentially he's dead. Laurie and Tylee, they tell similar stories to the police. They say they both heard the shooting and bizarrely at this point, there's no charges brought against anyone for Charles Fallow's death. And get this, after Charles is shot, after he is laid dead on the floor in the house, Laurie takes JJ to school. Like, in what world are you like, oh gosh, a shooting's just occurred in my home. A man is laid dead in my home. That man actually is my ex-husband. I, however, am on a time frame limit here because I need to get my child to school. So I'm going to just walk away from the scene of a crime and I'll deal with it later on. Said nobody who has actually been traumatized by this kind of reality said ever. But again, Laurie didn't get the memo. I guess she was just exhausted being such a sex goddess, having multiple marriages to all these people in different universes. It must be exhausting. I find one marriage exhausting enough, to be honest. Now, after Charles has died, Laurie actually sends a text, I kid you not, to Charles's sons. A text. And this text is basically informing them of their dad's death. She sent them a message, and then when they're calling desperately because their father's been killed, she doesn't even pick up the phone. I just tell you the text that she wrote. Hi boys, I have some very sad news today. Your dad passed away yesterday morning. I'm working on making arrangements and I'll keep you informed of what's going on. I'm still not sure how to handle things. Just want you to know that I love you. And so did your dad. Could you be any colder than that? No is the answer. 
Also, when she finally does have contact with these boys who are absolutely blindsided and devastated because it's the father, she basically was really vague about the answers. Charles's ex-wife had to literally turn to Google to get the answers that she needed. And it's at this point she realizes that Charles was shot by Alex Cox, Laurie's brother. Now, following the death of Charles, Laurie then moves the family, oh, surprisingly, to Rexburg, Idaho. Now, where have we heard Rexburg, Idaho from? Oh yeah, it's where Chad Daybell lives, isn't it? And again, throwing in the codependent relationship where Alex is concerned, he moves in to the same apartment complex. And then the unthinkable happens. Laurie's two children, Tylee and JJ, go missing. Tylee's 16 at this point. JJ, beautiful JJ, was seven. The last sighting of Tylee was on the 8th of September 2019. There was a sighting at Yellowstone National Park. She's with JJ, Laurie and Alex Cox. In fact, the last known picture of Tylee before she disappeared is indeed taken there. On 9th of September 2019, investigators discover that Alex's cell phone GPS actually places him in Chad Daybell's backyard for about two hours. Now, soon after Alex left that property, Chad messages his wife saying, I spotted a big raccoon along the fence. I hurried and got my gun and he was still walking along. I got close enough that one shot did the trick. He's now in our pet cemetery. A little bit ominous, to be honest, texting your wife about that. And is he actually talking about a pet or otherwise? I don't know. Now, JJ was actually last seen a few weeks after that text. He was last seen on the 22nd of September, 2019. This is the last known picture of JJ. Friends of Laurie, somebody called Melanie Gibb and her boyfriend, they'd actually been staying with Laurie for the weekend. And her boyfriend said that he saw Alex carry JJ into Laurie's apartment. Now, the next morning, when they asked if they could see JJ, Laurie says that JJ was being a zombie and Alex had to take him away. Now, that in itself is horrifying because we know what Chad Daybell says about zombies and what needs to happen to them. Now, we get to the 23rd of September. At this point, investigators say that Alex's cell phone GPS shows he's in Chad's backyard. Again, this time he's in that yard for 17 minutes. So what's going on? What's going on that he is in Chad Daybell's yard? Particularly in light of the fact that both of these children have now gone missing, apparently vanished into thin air. Now in October 2019, another unbelievable event occurs. Chad Daybell's wife, Tammy, dies. Now at the time, they said it was natural causes. Chad and Tammy's son said that Tammy had died in her bed. He'd called Chad about it. Apparently Chad was devastated. Of course he was. Of course Chad was devastated because he's such a good man. Now, at the time, the family declined an autopsy. The coroner said, listen, this death appears to be natural. And Tammy had actually been ill prior to her death. And understandably, it's devastating for a family to have to go through an autopsy. So they agreed that that wouldn't occur. Now, approximately, just put this into context, guys. You've just lost your wife. She's birthed five children. You've had a happy family as far as she's concerned. Suddenly, she's died. Harrowing, horrific, any of you have lost a partner out there in such sudden circumstances, blindsiding and breathtakingly cruel on an emotional level. For most people. But not for Chad. Chad was like, well, I could go down that whole grief route or I could concentrate on hope. And I could get back with my ex, shall I say. Well, I say ex, was she an ex? Because I was actually married to her in previous lifetimes. So she's not really an ex. She's always been my wife. So he literally, two weeks after Tammy's death, marries Laurie. Can somebody please, please explain how this would ever be considered acceptable by anybody? If this is not a big red flag, just playing out in real time. I don't know what is. In fact, there should just be an every wedding photograph because they got married on a beach in Hawaii. Yeah, in 2019 on November the 5th. There should be big red flags inserted over every picture of them, just above the heads. Because this is a walking red flag. Understandably, family members are concerned. 
and they're questioning how on earth has this happened because two weeks is nothing. And how disrespectful to Tammy's memory and how arrogant and how egotistical for them to go ahead and do this when other people are grieving. But like I said, Laurie and Chad believe they're special. So rules don't apply to them. And Tammy's sister rightly said, you don't get married weeks after you just buried your wife of almost 30 years. You just don't do that. Amen. Amen to that. Now, of course, we have a problem because these two are on a beach getting married. No sign of the kids. And even though JJ was living with Laurie, there were other interested parties in his life. So later in that same November, the grandmother in this case, Kay Woodcock, says... I would like you to go and check on my grandson, JJ. Usually we'd get FaceTime calls, usually there'd be some kind of contact, we've had none. I haven't heard from JJ in months and I'm really worried about his welfare. So the police do as ask, they go and perform a welfare check in Rexburg, Idaho. They're looking for JJ and Laurie just tells the police when they arrive that JJ's safe and that he's staying with a friend, Melanie Gibb in Arizona. The first thing that the police do, of course, is contact Melanie Gibb. Now, initially, she isn't that forthcoming about where JJ was, but she obviously has time to think and imagine what she's becoming complicit in over a period of time. She's probably spoken to her partner who's going, why have you not told the police the truth? It's going to bite you on the ass. So essentially then she gets back in contact with the police and says, listen, JJ isn't with me. So the police are now very, very concerned because she, the mother, is lying to them and they don't know where JJ is. And then they realise that Tylee Ryan is also missing. So her daughter is also missing. And now they're really worried. And it goes national. Some of the investigative journalists on this case were amazing. There are some died in the wool great researchers. Most journalists are bought and paid for, aren't they? We all know that, we all know it. But there are some, they just can't help it. They have to figure out what's happening. There's this emotional connection to the individuals that are lost and they are gonna find them in some way, shape or form. And so it sets on fire. There's this nationwide search for the children. And what is really disconcerting in this situation is that Laurie and Chad just seem completely unconcerned about their children's disappearances. They go back to Hawaii whilst the police are searching for the children. They're just off. I'll just go back to Hawaii. It's a lovely place. Yes, it is, Laurie. It's a lovely place for people who are in a good mental state and aren't dealing with two children who's disappeared. But she is just telling herself this story that the whole world is wrong and she's right. Now, the police are asking them questions. They refuse to answer any. And this becomes a national and then an international story. Investigators at this point are going to themselves, this couple look really weird, you know? We've dealt with the very recent death of Tammy Daybell. Now there are two children related to this couple who've disappeared. This feels suspicious and concerning. So at that point, remember, Tammy's death had been ruled natural. But the investigators, because they're really concerned that maybe something more challenging has occurred and maybe something more sinister has occurred. So then investigators go ahead and exhume Tammy's body in order to conduct an autopsy. This happens in December 2019. And bear in mind, another bizarre occurrence in December 2019 is that Laurie's brother, Alex Cox, dies in Arizona. Now that's determined to be caused by natural causes. Apparently he had a blood clot. He'd also recently got married and his wife said he was acting super strangely. There was just something really untoward about his behavior. And her son also felt that there was something really unusual. And they'd kind of been thrown together by Laurie and Chad. It had been suggested that they connect and get married. And so they were kind of following as well this belief system that Chad and Laurie were super special, which they're not. Well, maybe they are, but only special in a very dark, malevolent way. Now, we get to January 2020, and Laurie's oldest child at this point, a guy called Colby Ryan, he releases a YouTube video, and this YouTube video is urging his mother to just come clean, help the authorities find Tylee and JJ. And he said this, I know you know what the right thing to do is, and I know you have a good heart. He did this in this seven-minute clip, and he said, it is time to do the right thing. We get to the 25th of January 2020. At this point, authorities served Laurie Vallow Daybell at this point, an order requiring her to produce her children. And she doesn't. And Laurie fails to do this, so that means she's in contempt. So then she's arrested on the 20th of February 2020. So she's arrested initially in Hawaii, and then two weeks later she's extradited to Idaho. Now, despite Laurie being arrested, Laurie and Chad still continue to refuse where the children are. 
police continued this very frustrating investigation. And then at this point, on the 9th of June 2020, the FBI, Rexburg Police and Fremont County Sheriff's Office descend upon Chad Daybell's home on his property in Rexburg, Idaho. Remember, earlier on I said there were these weird scenarios where Alex was in his backyard? Yeah, that seems to be something that investigators want to explore. And they start to dig in the areas of the backyard where they had discovered Alex Cox's cell phone GPS had pinged in September 2019. Now, tragically, during that dig, two bodies were discovered. Investigators found what they believed were the remains of JJ. He was buried under a tree on the land. The remains were actually still dressed in a pair of red pajamas, which is very important because the picture that he's in last, he's wearing red pajamas. And then in a pit around 50 yards away, police found the remains of who they believed was Tylee. That was in the pet cemetery. And that really worries me because of that text that was sent to Tammy when she was alive, indicating that he'd actually shot and killed an animal and put that animal in the pet cemetery. And you think, was he actually referring to Tylee in that description? They found dismembered, charred bones and body parts. They'd basically been scattered all around the area. And police, like I said, came to that conclusion as I just did, that Chad had messaged his wife saying he was burying a raccoon when actually he was burying her. Bear in mind, Chad Daybell was in that area. He was watching this dig play out when the police were there. And he decided, I think at some point, Mm, they're in an area I don't want them to dig and I don't know whether it's going to end well for me so I'm just going to hot foot off. So he actually gets in his vehicle and tries to leave but at this point he's quickly apprehended. Now initially he is charged for destruction or concealment of evidence because understandably they can't actually at this point say that he's murdered anyone. Now later in June the authorities confirmed that the remains were JJ Vallow and Tylee Ryan. Can you imagine this guys? We're talking about children, two children who end up buried under a tree and in a pet cemetery. Two children who were loved, who were the members of the family adored, but that Charles and Laurie have decided no longer deserve a place in this world. Tylee's DNA was also found on a pickaxe and a shovel in a shed on the property, which is just harrowing. At this point, Laurie's former in-laws and JJ's grandparents all came together and just urged Laurie, just tell the truth. Talk about what happened to JJ. Talk about what happened to Tylee. They want answers and they need answers. But of course, Laurie and Chad did none of that. And then they get the autopsy results of Tammy Daybell. And guess what? That rules that her death was actually caused by asphyxiation. The original autopsy, that hadn't shown any clear evidence because her death was initially considered natural. So they weren't looking. Essentially, they just went with the idea that she hadn't been very well and that's why there was no immediate suspicion of foul play because Chad as well had said that she'd been feeling unwell for a while. She was 49, which meant that it was a young death, but even though it was a young death, essentially because of her apparently being ill before, it didn't raise that suspicion. So she wasn't examined thoroughly and that meant that foul play was disregarded as opposed to suspected. But clearly now they realise they're dealing with individuals who have literally serial killed. It's as simple as that. So at this point in Boyce, Idaho, in May 2021, a then 49-year-old Laurie and a then 54-year-old Chad were charged as co-defendants with two counts of first-degree murder for the deaths of Tylee and JJ, conspiracy and grand theft. Now, Alex Cox, he was also named as a co-conspirator in the children's murders, but bear in mind at this point it's irrelevant because he's dead. So he's already met his maker and maybe he's already serving his sentence. Chad at this point also charged with the murder of Tammy and Laurie is charged for conspiring with him. Chad's also accused at this point of insurance fraud. This related to the death of Tammy. The pair essentially pled not guilty to all of the charges. Interestingly, by the way, Charles Vallow was somebody who had quite a big payout when he died. And without a doubt, Laurie had believed that she was going to receive the monies. What she didn't realise was that he had changed the beneficiary because he knew damn straight that if anything happened to him, she would benefit and he didn't want her to benefit. So she could have also have been done for this if he hadn't changed that particular reality. So Charles really was onto Laurie, essentially from the very beginning of her relationship with Chad. Now, of course, how do... Laurie and Chad plead in this case, not guilty to all charges. 
Now, of course, the reason that Laurie will have gone not guilty is because she believes that she's a martyr, doesn't she? And she believes that she's a good mother. She's had to kill her children because she needs to purify her children from the evil spirits that possess them. So she's not a terrible parent. She's not somebody who literally allowed her children to be murdered. No, she saved them. Remember, she is so important as one of the most important spiritual beings in the universe, in fact, that if she hadn't done that, well, they might have been taken fully by the apocalyptic reality of their souls being blackened and darkened by the zombies who possess them. You know, there's no redemption for them unless she murders them. That's the way her mind works. So a friend of Laurie's basically said that Laurie was convinced by Chad that her children had turned dark, that they were zombies. And basically it traps the soul of the child. You know, the child can't return to the body that's been essentially taken over and can't leave the body because they're trapped within it. So they can't go to heaven, of course. And the only way that that can occur is if somebody frees the spirit of the child from their body. Therefore, it's completely okay to kill them. They're releasing the child. They're not condemning the child to death, they're releasing the child. Killing the child is mercy as far as they're concerned. And bear in mind, Laurie believes she's a goddess who's been brought to earth to bring the second coming of Christ, so she has a right to do it. Apparently the couple had a scoring system to determine whether the people were good or evil as well. And the prosecutor said that Chad and Laurie both believed that JJ and Tylee were zombies who died and had been repossessed by evil spirits. So like I said, the only way to free them is to kill them because otherwise they're going to spend eternity in limbo, in purgatory. Now, the prosecutor in this case isn't buying any of that BS and says, listen, all three of these individuals were killed because they were simply obstacles for Laurie and Chad's relationship. And conveniently, just to add to why I believe that prosecutor is entirely true, none of Charles's five children were apparently zombies. So none of my children are zombies at all, so they're all okay. Oh, that's convenient. So they're all going to be able to live. Yes, yes, yes. My uh, five children are light beings. They are all going to be fine. What about my kids? Oh, oh, it's not looking good. It's not looking good for your kids. Why? Why? What, what's wrong with my kids? Well, your kids are unfortunately the absolute opposite. They're zombies with blackened souls and the only way to get them to heaven is to kill them. Again, how egocentric of Chad Dable. He is so desperate for power, so hungry to be able to control that he doesn't care about killing children that aren't related to him. No, that's fine. So he goes ahead and incites Laurie to be okay with that. And she goes ahead because she is equally as fractured and broken and dark as he is. Now, the couple's trial for the crimes against the children and Tammy were actually delayed for over three years. And the reason for that is because of Laurie's mental health. There were a lot of concerns over her mental health. And actually, after Laurie was indicted, she had a mental health evaluation that lasted a month. And that meant that her trial was actually put on pause whilst they were assessing what was going on. In 2021, in the August of that year, what we did hear was that the prosecutors would seek the death penalty for Chad Daybell. Now, in September 2021, Chad Daybell's five children actually spoke out. This is when he's awaiting trial. And they said they believe that their father is innocent. I mean, I think they're lovely people because it just shows you that their experience of him makes them feel that he could not possibly have the propensity and violence within him to actually do what we're talking about today. But just as he has certain delusions, I believe so too do they. His daughter, Emma Murray, said that she believes Chad was framed by Alex and Laurie for the crimes. Like I said, everyone's a victim in their own story. As far as they're concerned, he's a victim in his own story. Come on, he married her two weeks after your mum died. Let's just be real here. He is not a good human being. And again, I've said this time and time again, you can be nice 95% of the time, but if 5% of the time you're going around killing children, you're not nice. It's as simple as that. Now, in April 2022, Laurie's actually deemed competent for trial. She refused to enter a plea for the charges. And the reason for that is we know psychologically she feels above them. She's a martyr now. This is how crazy her mental gymnastics will be. It will be a case of, I am Laurie, but I'm not really Laurie, I'm a goddess. Throughout history, people like me are always crucified. 
So she is essentially Christ on the cross. She is prepared for this psychologically. I have done these amazing good things. I have killed who need to be freed to go to heaven. I have literally given them redemption. And none of you understand because you're all going to die in the fiery apocalypse. I know that. You don't know that. And at the end of the day, I will just sit in my cell and I will just contemplate how I know so much more than you. And one day you will all realize that I was right. That's her mindset. So why is she going to enter any plea at that point? So the judge at this point enters a not guilty plea on her behalf. The trial's then paused again for another mental health check. We then get to August 2022 and Laurie's lawyers actually at this point seek a change in charges. The reason for this is they believe that the conspiracy charges are really oddly constructed and that that could confuse a jury. So then we get to September 2022. Another announcement is made because, you know, we all wanted to see this play out on court TV, didn't we? But it didn't, because at this point, the judge said that cameras would be banned from the courtroom. He said that he felt there wouldn't be a fair trial if that was the case. We then arrive in January 2023. At this point, the judge rejects a request from Laurie's lawyers that Laurie and Chad be able to meet in person and on the phone to discuss strategies and settlement options. Basically, the pair's attorneys made lots of requests. They included that the trial be delayed till 2024 and also a request from Chad's lawyers and Laurie's lawyers that the death penalty be taken off the table. So there's all these back and forths. Now, eventually, there was notice that the trial would start in March 2023. The judge granted the motion for Laurie and Charles to be tried separately at this point. Now, it was Chad's lawyers who'd actually made the request for the judge to sever the trial so they'd be tried separately. Some said that that separation was basically an advantage to the defence and a disadvantage to the prosecutors and taxpayers who had used resources to get the couple tried together because that's what they'd wanted. Laurie's trial then is scheduled to start on April the 3rd and at that point, Chad's was not scheduled. In March 2023, it's then determined that Laurie will not face the death penalty. Now... I think there is a chance that she could have been given the death penalty. You just have to think about the fact that Eileen Wernos got the death penalty. But I think the reason is because we're more seasoned in looking at somebody's mental state. I think that there are some questions as far as the prosecution and the defence have about her sanity. I guess as well, there are complications this introduces because death penalty cases are always far more complex because you're literally talking about life and death. And I suppose there is another reason why they wanted to take the death penalty off the table because it's going to affect an already traumatised family because Laurie Vallow is a member of this family. And if she is killed, that could be even more traumatizing for them they've already lost these children so Laurie's lawyers just want that taken off the table completely the judge agrees to this and at this point he also noted that Laurie had not waived her right to a speedy trial so the proceeding couldn't be rescheduled to give her defense team ample time to review the evidence so essentially now because of that the death penalty is off the table we get to the 23rd of April 2023 and her actual trial begins Jury selection took some time. They required 1,800 potential jurors to complete a 20-page questionnaire to trial and to remove anyone who would unfairly try the case. So there were 12 jurors and then six alternative jurors who were selected to hear the case in total. So on the 10th of April, finally, the prosecution and defence make their opening arguments. The prosecution go for the belief that Laurie has been motivated by these cult beliefs and she's got this lust for Chad and she's got this financial greed where Charles is concerned and that she and her brother Alex conspired to kill Charles so that she could make money. But Laurie's defense attorney says, no, Laurie's this really loving and protected mother. She's simply fallen under the sway of Chad's weird apocalyptic religious beliefs. So it's all Chad's fault. It's got nothing to do with Laurie. So they argue that Chad and Alex are the ones who are actually responsible for all the deaths. We get to May 2023. At this point, in spite of those arguments, the Idaho jury find Laurie guilty of all charges for her role in the deaths of Tylee, JJ, and indeed Chad's first wife, Tammy. So at this point, she is convicted of first-degree murder and conspiracy to commit first-degree murder in the deaths of Tylee and JJ. She was also convicted of conspiracy to commit first-degree murder in the death of Tammy, and she was also accused of stealing social security payments issued for her children. So grand theft in that particular charge. 
Now, before her sentencing, Laurie's actually given an opportunity to speak in the court. And then when she does, she basically denies that JJ, Tylee and Tammy have even been murdered. And this is what she says. I mourn with all of you who mourn my children and Tammy. Jesus Christ knows the truth of what happened here. Sorry, I'm just gonna cut in here. I'm sorry, I'm in the court. I'm in the court. She started saying this. I'm just like, excuse me, excuse me, Laurie. Yes, yes, I'm just in a very Messiah-like way saying how I'm completely innocent. Yes, I know, I'm just gonna say, you know the bit where you say that Jesus Christ knows what's happened? Yes, yes, the big JC knows. Yes, he knows you're a massive murderer. He knows it, you're a murderer. Anyway, I'll let her carry on. So she says, Jesus Christ knows the truth of what happened here. Jesus Christ knows that no one was murdered in this case. No, those bodies that are found in Chad Daybell's backyard, no, they weren't murdered. They weren't murdered. They were freed, guys. They were released. She says, accidental deaths happen. Yes, they do, Laurie. They do. For example, when you fall downstairs and you die, when you choke on a piece of pasty, these things happen. They're awful, but they're rare, aren't they? But apparently accidental deaths happen and she's throwing the deaths of her two children into this and Tammy into this. She says suicides happen. Fatal side effects from medications happen. Yes, she's right on every single level, none of which refer to the murders of her children. Laurie also said that her victims are now happy in heaven. She actually said that she can communicate with dead relatives. She can communicate with Jesus Christ and angels. So she can just communicate with pretty much everyone. Step away, these psychic mediums who are on TV. Forget it, you just need Laurie Vallow. She can speak to everyone. She said, because of these communications, I know for a fact that my children are happy and busy in the spirit world. They're not just happy, guys. They're busy. They've got a veritable timetable that we would be envious of. She also claimed that her children had visited her from the grave and told her they were happy and didn't blame her for the deaths. How very convenient. She also described Tammy Dabel, the woman who she conspired to murder and who died very young. Yes, she described Tammy Dabel as her eternal friend. And we all know that's probably because, you know, Tammy's accepted that Laurie was in fact married to Chad in a different universe, in a different paradigm, in a different body. And so she's okay with the fact that those two were obviously adulterous and murdered many people. So with all that in mind, when it comes down to her sentencing on the 31st of July, 2023, she is given that sentence of life without parole for the charges of murder and conspiracy to commit murder. And that was indeed the maximum penalty that she could receive. She was also given a 10 year sentence for grand theft because she was taking social security payments that she wasn't entitled to do. And Laurie was also ordered to pay more than $50,000 for fines and civil penalties for the three victims and restitution. At the sentencing, the judge rightly said to Laurie, you had so many other options. You could have gotten divorced. You could have found someone else to take care of those kids. And as the state was able to prove at trial, you chose the most evil and destructive path possible. He said, you justified all of this by going down a bizarre religious rabbit hole. And clearly you are still down there. Clearly, as I've said, guys, Laurie feels like she is a martyr. She's entitled in her mind to have done what she's done. She thinks we're all stupid. We're all going to burn in hell and she's going to ascend to heaven, probably exactly as she is, but with her hair even more perfect. And then everybody is going to be like, oh, they were all so wrong about you, Laurie. That's not going to happen. She's going to be super disappointed when she takes her last breath and the elevator arrives and she's like, I'm not so sure I want to go down that fiery apocalyptic line. Why not? You are massively, massively massively interested in the books that Chad wrote. Why don't you actually deal with it on a physical level now for eternity? Also, unsurprisingly, two years after Charles Vallow had been shot, his death was also ruled a homicide. Now, understandably, Alex was dead at this point, so he couldn't be charged, but Laurie was absolutely implicated in the homicide. And at that point, she was also additionally charged with conspiracy to commit murder. There was suspicion that Chad was involved, but no actual charges have been made against him, but it would make sense that he had been involved. Laurie and Alex were also accused of trying to murder Laurie's niece's husband, Brandon Bordeaux, in 2019. Brandon was apparently shot in 2019, but it didn't make impact, so he was shot at, but managed to survive it. He was driving near his home at the time. He didn't, like I said, get injured, but he could have. So Laurie also faces a charge of conspiracy to commit murder in that case. 
I mean, we're talking about serial killing beyond belief, aren't we? Now, following the sentencing for the murders of her children and Tammy, she was then extradited from Idaho to Arizona to face these extra charges I've just talked about. She's pled guilty on both of those charges. She's actually awaiting her trial. She's apparently asked to represent herself. Please, God, if that be the case, let them bring court TV in because I would certainly absolutely watch that case play out. I love somebody who wants to self-represent. It always makes me feel that sense of self-satisfaction because the narcissism is huge in those people and they genuinely believe with absolutely no experience they can do a better job than seasoned lawyers. Now, Chad Daybell, he's also now been found guilty and he's actually been sentenced to death. The recommendation of the jury was indeed that he was convicted of first degree murder and conspiracy charges in the killings of his first wife and two children with his second wife. He was convicted of first degree murder and conspiracy charges in those deaths and they went for the death sentence. They absolutely felt he deserved that. In a lengthy verdict read in court, it said that the penalty was appropriate under the law. The judge imposed a 15 year prison sentence on top of that for insurance charges too. Apparently he was really stoic when that was read out. He didn't really react at all. But I think we can all agree that says something about, again, the martyrdom complex. These two genuinely believe they are the veritable GC and that somehow we are all wrong and they are all absolutely right. So the prosecution in this said basically said that the reason that he was involved in the killings was because he was fueled by power, sex, money and apocalyptic spiritual beliefs and because of all of that both the jury, the judge and of course the prosecution without a doubt agreed that the only penalty that was appropriate would indeed be the death penalty. Whether that happens soon, whether that happens in decades, we do not know, we never know do we? But essentially he will meet his maker at some point and I genuinely know that he isn't going to be going anywhere near heaven. And I also believe that Chad Daybell isn't as delusional as Laurie. I think that Laurie is somebody who had absolutely the capacity to kill. I do believe that's within her. But I genuinely feel if she had never met Chad Daybell, then she would never have become this murderous individual. There was something about the two that made them all powerful in their own minds and their egos were pumped so hugely in their own belief systems that it just meant that they had license to do whatever they wanted. And bear in mind, they never believed that they'd be caught because the only person who genuinely has power over them in their minds is God. Yes, lock them up. Yes, put them to death. Yes, do all of those things. But in their mindsets, their egos were so enormous that who cares? Because at the end of the day, they're super special you're all wrong and they do not have to abide by your laws only the laws that they have convinced themselves they need to live by which is anything that they want to do in any way they want to do it at a cost of whoever they do it to it's as simple as that i would love to know your thoughts on this one leave me a comment give me a like let me know whether you feel that Laurie in this case is indeed somebody who's dealing with really poor mental health, whether Chad Daybell absolutely took advantage of it, whether it is indeed a folie adieu, a madness of two, or whether they are both deep manipulators who care little about anybody else and absolutely care only about their own needs. I'll see you again next time, guys. Take care.